esta preciosa mañana, el Señor es bueno y maravilloso, así que bienvenidos, vamos a adorar juntos al Señor.
porque Él es bueno y maravilloso con cada uno de nosotros. Let's continue worshiping to the Lord this morning because He is wonderful with each and every one of us. This song is called I Believe in You. Sometimes we're going through troubles and tribulations in our life and we don't understand why at that time. But God knows why and that's why we believe in Him and we just trust in Him at all times. Amen. Gloria a Dios. En las pruebas y las luchas, hermanos, Dios siempre estará con usted y conmigo. Amén.
God bless you, friends. What a joy it is to be able to worship alongside you and share God's word with you. Want to let you know that we're praying for you. And for those who have been watching online and have not yet had an opportunity to worship with us in person, let me tell you, you're missing out. We'd love to see you in person. We meet every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. We also meet every Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. I'd love to see you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your prayers and your support. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for leading us down the path of victory. And I pray that as we continue with our series on how to enjoy the rest of our lives, that we could take these truths and apply them so that we may truly enjoy that life of victory that Christ made possible for us. And I especially pray for all those who are watching, who are going through difficult situations in their lives, that they recognize that they have everything they need to be successful. What they need to do is take these biblical truths and apply them in their lives, rely on you and the, and the Holy Spirit, and do these things that will put them on a path to success and victory. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in a series titled, How to Enjoy the Rest of Your Life. And we're studying one of the smallest books in all the Bible. It was actually a letter written to a group of Christians in the ancient city of Philippi. It was written by Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament. And in this little book, Paul mentions the words uh, joy, uh, joyful, gladness, 19 different times. And what is so uh, amazing about this letter is that Paul writes it while he was a prisoner. He was in the middle of very adverse circumstances, yet he finds the joy and the peace of mind to encourage those who were in Philippi to experience that same life of victory. And that's why we're studying this book. And that is why we're studying chapter after chapter, because in it we will find the truths we need to truly understand and learn how to enjoy the rest of our lives. And we're in a series, in a, in a, we've come to a, ser- to a point in the series where we're going to look at conquering complaining. If you want to enjoy the rest of your life, you're going to have to figure out how to overcome complaining and whining and moping. Things that bring us down and distract us from the plan and the purpose that God has for us. You know, whenever Daniel Webster, the lawyer and statesman from the early 1800s, met an acquaintance whose name he forgot, he would ask this question. How's the old complaint? Nine times out of ten, that person would begin to unfold some grievances that they had discussed with Mr. Webster. 
And that is how Mr. Webster would remember them and identify them. You know, it is possible for some of us to be known by our complaints. Some people can be recognized by their dissatisfaction and their grumbling. And because we live in a most proper, prosperous nation in the history of the world, we have developed some unrealistic views of what life is supposed to be. That failure to meet that standard leaves us feeling cheated, soured, and pretty negative. As a result, we do more complaining and griping than most people on the face of the planet. Now, are you familiar with first world problems? Now, these, are problem fa- these are problems that people from wealthy nations or certain classes of people from developing nations who are considered insignificant or petty by people from poor countries or struggling classes. You see, most often, a problem of, of minor or inconsequential inconveniences. And most of us who live in the United States have these types of first world problems. And these are inconsequential. They're nothing compared to some of the problems people in most of the world have to endure. I'll give you some examples. You complain that your walk-in closet is not big enough. Or someone has eaten one of the hot dogs that was in your refrigerator, and because of that, now you have an extra bun, and you don't know how to enjoy that extra bun because that extra hot dog has been eaten up. These are first world problems. They're inconsequential. They're minor in the face of so many things that people are dealing with. And yet, a lot of people make mountains out of molehills over these minor inconsequential things. Reminds me of an epitaph um, that was found on an old tombstone. This is what it said. Here lies Edward Jacobs. He lived to a gripe old age. Now, friends, griping can become a lifelong habit that can be hard to break. There's a difference between legitimate complaining and constructive criticism and critique and what the scriptures call sinful murmuring and grumbling. Now, there are times when we need to complain about things in our society. The ancient nation of Israel provides a relevant example, however, of how obsessive complaining could affect our relationship with God. And this is what introduces us to the problem of complaining and how constant complaining can pull us apart from God. Remember, the Israelites had every reason to be grateful. God had delivered them from bondage in Egypt. He had part of the Red Sea for them to escape. He was providing shade during the day and light at night. He was providing literally food from heaven called manna. But when they found themselves trapped between the Egyptians and the Red Sea, just a few days into the wilderness, they found themselves thirsty and hungry. And even though God continued to provide in miraculous ways, the people continued to complain. Eventually, the Israelites would complain to Moses and say, weren't there enough graves in Egypt that you had to bring us out here in the middle of nowhere in the desert? Why are we talking about complaining Israelites and an angry God? What does this have to do with the theme of our series, How to Enjoy the Rest of Your Life? Well, the answer to that brings us to the section in the book of Philippians where we're going to pick up our series. And that is in Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. And this is what Paul writes in Philippians 2, verses 14 and 15. He says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like the stars in the sky. Now, this phrase, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation, is a direct quote from the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, which is a retelling of Israel's history, Israel's exodus from Egypt and emergence as a nation. Now, this was Paul's way of thinking that Jesus has come to lead us on a new exodus to free and deliver us from bondage to sin. And even though Christians do not live under Israel's covenant with God, Paul states that we can learn from Israel's experience with God. And he says to the church in Corinth that the things that happened to the nation of Israel, particularly in their wilderness wanderings, 
happened as examples for us that we would not repeat the same mistakes. Listen to what Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 10. He says, do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. He's referring to the experience of the nation of Israel in the wilderness. Now that tells us, friends, that some very important things about the danger of constant complaining. Let me give a few of you, let me give you a few just here real quickly. Number one, complaining disputes God's authority. Now last week, we studied the two verses just before uh, Philippians 2, uh, verse 15. Philippians 2, 13 and 14 says this, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. He says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Now watch the connection. When we have a complaining spirit, we are saying that the work of, that God is doing in your life is insufficient or ineffective or both. It is a covert or overt expression of distrust that God knows what he's doing. Now here's the second reason complaining is so dangerous. Not only does it dispute God's authority, but complaining disrupts Christian unity. When we begin complaining and grumbling, we start looking for someone else to blame. Have you ever noticed how many people frame their complaints? They disassociate themselves and shift the blame to others. They say things like, what's wrong with them? Why don't they do something? And very rarely do you hear someone complain like this, what's wrong with us? Why don't we do something? You see, complaining disassociates us from that which we should be involved in. Complaining divides and disrupts. The third reason complaining is so dangerous is because it discredits a believer's witness. That's right. Complaining could discredit a believer's witness. When we begin to grumble and mope around and exude a complaining spirit, we repel people instead of attracting them. I don't know about you, but hanging around people that complain all the time is not a pleasant experience. And most people repel constant complainers. And I can't help but think that as Paul wrote this letter to this congregation in Philippi, he was recalling his experience in planning that church. It was not glorious. It was not pleasant, as you recall. Paul and Silas were witnessing when a slave girl started following them around, and they were, she was disrupting their work. Paul prayed over this young girl and delivered her from that evil spirit. And when word got back to her master, no longer having use for her, he filed trumped up charges against Paul and Silas, and they ended up in jail. It was while Paul and Silas were in jail that God worked a miracle that led to the jailer putting his trust in Jesus. Now, can you imagine if Paul and Silas were pouting instead of praising in that prison cell? The reason the doors opened and the, jail, the, the jailer was converted was because there were Christians in this jail who didn't complain about their circumstances, though they had every right to do so. They were Christians who, by the power of God, had an inner peace that transcended their circumstances, and that is what enabled them to praise God openly and to be an effective witness of Christ in that jail. There's a drawing power in praise, and conversely, there's a crippling power in complaining. This is why it's so important to recognize the detrimental, destructive effects of complaining. That God that Paul and Silas were praising God, because it was in seeing that praise in spite of the circumstances that opened the heart of that jailer in Philippi to put his trust and faith in Jesus. So this brings us to the heart of today's message. How do we conquer complaining? If you know someone who is a constant complainer and whiner, how do you overcome this? Well, number one, admit that this is a problem for you. You have to recognize it. You have to acknowledge it. Not for other people, not for your wife, not kids, your parents, your in-laws, your co-workers, but for you. Often the most difficult step in learning to conquer complaining is to recognize it in yourself. James Baldwin once said, not everything that is faced can be changed, 
But nothing is changed until it's faced. We have to come to grips. If we have this bad habit of complaining all the time, of, of griping, we have to recognize it. The problem is most of us don't see ourselves as complainers. We see ourselves as problem spotters. We consider ourselves truth tellers. We say it like we see it. But let me help you with this. Listen to these simple diagnostic questions. What's it like to be on the other side of you? If you woke up tomorrow and discovered you were married to you, would you be happy or devastated? What if you had to work for you? Would you quit? Was it, what is it like for others when you show up? How is it to play tennis with you? How is it to have to co-lead with you? Do you find yourself using the word but frequently? Oh, he's a good man, but. It's a good job, but. She's got a good personality, but. You see, but is a word that almost always focuses on the downside. Do you find people often bringing their complaints to you? Why do you think that is? Could it be that they have a sympathetic ear in you? Or one who also shares their knack for negativity? Friends, complaining isn't just a bad habit that makes us miserable to be around. It's a sin that God will hold you accountable to. James, the brother of Jesus, said it like this. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge, God... The judge with a capital J is standing at the door. You see, God takes complaining seriously and so should we. Recognize that complaining is a sin against God that disputes his authority, disrupts Christian unity, and discredits a believer's witness. So how do we conquer complaining? One, admit this is a problem. Here's number two. Omit the blame game omit the blame game. Many times complaining is nothing more than a lame attempt to blame others for our problems. In fact, some people go as far as to blame God himself. The writer of Proverbs in chapter 19 verse 3 said this, some people ruin themselves by their own stupid actions and then they blame the Lord. You know, as one guy put it, don't complain how the ball bounces if you're the one who dropped it. Now, there's a principle in Scripture that is repeated. It goes something like this. You reap what you sow. And when I reap what I've sown, I have no basis to complain about the result. You are free to make choices, but then you're not ever free from the consequences of that choice. Yet it's common to hear people complain about debt, for example. Is it possible that they were irresponsible with their spending? They spent money they didn't have to buy, things they didn't need to impress people they didn't even like. That's just one of many examples. Reminds me of the story about the construction worker who would pull out his lunch from his lunch pail every day and he would start complaining about his sandwich. One day he pulled out his sandwich and he says, I'm sick and tired of this. It's the same thing every single day bologna sandwich. I'm sick and tired of this. If I have to eat another bologna sandwich. And then one of his co-workers jumped in and said, relax, buddy. Just tell your wife to pack you something different the next day. The man said, leave my wife out of this. I pack my own lunch. The moral of this story is, is as much as we want to blame others, most of the bologna in your life, you put that yourself. So we have to omit the blame game. Here's number three, how to conquer complaining. Transmit an attitude of gratitude. Transmit an attitude of gratitude. Listen to these great words Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. He said, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God wants us to be thankful in all circumstances, not necessarily for all circumstances. We cannot always be genuinely thankful for all circumstances. The fact that I'm a grateful person has nothing to do with my circumstances. The great Bible commentator Matthew Henry was once assaulted by robbers in the streets of London. 
Listen to what he wrote in his personal journal as he reflected on this traumatic event. He said, Lord, let me be thankful first because I was never robbed before. Second, because although they took my purse, they did not take my life. Third, because although they took my all, it was not much. And fourth, because it was I who was robbed, not I who robbed. Now this was a man who knew how to follow Paul's instructions to give thanks in everything, not necessarily for everything. You see, to conquer complaining, you have to learn an attitude of gratitude. The word transmit means to send out, to convey, to communicate. Some people transmit a negative vibe. They consistently send out a negative, nasty tone. You see, everyone has a climate. Everyone has a climate. And when you see people coming, uh, you see a forecast. Some people bring a ray of sunshine wherever they go. And some people bring big, dark clouds and thunderstorms wherever they go. And every relationship has a climate. The question is, what's your climate? Is it one of trust or jealousy or insecurity, hope? Is it one of arrogance or kindness or tension? A mother and a daughter went shopping. They spent the whole day fighting traffic and large crowds as they went from store to store. When they were done, they were both tired and they were hungry. Their feet were hurting and they were feeling irritable. The mother looked at her daughter and said, Did you see that nasty look that sales lady gave me? The daughter said, She didn't give, give it to you, Mom. You had it when you went in. Friends, an attitude of gratitude is an effective attitude for chronic <clears throat> complaining. Here's another way to conquer complaining. Submit to God's plan and provision. Submit to God's plan and provision. If you want victory over complaining, look for God's hand in your circumstances. I like what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4 in verses 17 and 18. And he says, and this small and temporary trouble will suffer, will bring us a tremendous and eternal glory much greater than the trouble. For we fix our attention not on things that are seen, but on things that are unseen. What can be seen lasts only for a time, but what cannot be seen lasts forever. The point is, the way you see your life shapes your life. I heard a story about a first grade teacher who was having an interaction with one of her students on the first day of school. Little Ryan saw the clock turn 12 and he started packing his stuff to go home. When the teacher saw him, she said, Ryan, it's only lunchtime. It's not time to go home yet. He said, teacher, in kindergarten, we went home at 12 noon. The teacher said, but you're in first grade now. We have lunch at 12 and come back to class and then we go home. Little Ryan put his hands on his hips and asked, who signed me up for this program? Now, friends, this is a child's version of asking the same question adults ask. Why on earth am I here for? Why does this have to happen? What's the point of all this? What good is ever going to come out of this? Who on earth signed me up for this program? When... We can't trace God's hand. We have to trust God's heart. When you understand that this life is not all there is, that there is a greater purpose and a greater plan for you, that God has a purpose that is bigger than your pain, then you will be able to conquer your complaining. Because you will recognize that even Unpleasant things happen sometimes. But they're all part of God's broader plan and purpose for you. One afternoon, a bus driver was taking 40 children to school. On his way there, the brakes failed. As the bus hurled down the hill, he noticed a gate. But as he approached the gate to his horror, he saw a little boy sitting on that gate, waving at him. The bus driver had to make a decision in a split second. Either crash into the gate and save the 40 children on the bus or avoid the gate 
and risked the lives of all 40 children. The bus driver decided to save the 40 children aboard the bus, and he crashed right into the gate, instantly killing the little boy who was sitting on that gate. After the police arrived, parents showed up. Some wanted to express their appreciation to the bus driver, but was nowhere to be seen. He had been transported to the hospital because he was in shock. One parent said, that's understandable. No, the officer said, you see that little boy that he crashed into. That little boy that was on that gate was his son. Paul wrote to another church in Romans In verses 31 and 32 of chapter 8, he says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? That's exactly what God the Father did for us, didn't he? He gave up. His only begotten Son, so that you and I would be saved. And although we may not always be able to trace God's hand, we can always trust God's heart. So we have to submit to God's plan and trust God's provision. And here's the fifth way to conquer complaining. Commit to speech that benefits the kingdom. Commit to speech that benefits the kingdom. You know, complaining is a habit. And habits can only be broken by replacing them with something else. Something better, something healthier, something more wholesome. And that's why Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 4 verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Paul's not asking us to lie, to be fake, or to be phony. He's asking us to look for good in people. In other words, he's saying, speak life, not death. And when we do that, Paul says, we will become blameless. Blameless doesn't mean perfect, by the way. Blameless is not someone with a clean track record. Blameless is someone with a cleansed and submitted heart to the will of God. Paul would later write in many of his letters that he was the worst of sinners and the first that needed forgiveness. We are not to blame, we are not blameless because we're faultless. We become blameless by forgiveness and growth and grace. And then he says, we become pure in Philippians 2.15. Not only do we become blameless, but we become pure. The original word is integrity. Integrity means my words and my deeds are in alignment. I am who I am no matter where I am or who I am with. He says, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without a fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. Friends, if you want to enjoy the rest of your life, you're going to have to conquer constant and chronic complaining. Don't let a complaining spirit get in the way of your joy and get in the way of your victory. Ask God to help you by putting in action these truths that we learn today. Commit to speech that benefits the kingdom. Submit to God's plan and provision. Transmit an attitude of gratitude. Omit the blame game and admit that this is a problem for you. If you take these and you put them in action in your lives, not only will you overcome complaining And not be a repellent of people, but be a magnet of people. But you will soon discover how to enjoy the life of victory that Jesus made possible for you. Let's pray. 
We thank you, Lord, for this time in your word. I thank you that you have shown us how to overcome a spirit of complaining and how complaining gets in the way of your purpose and plans for our lives and how it often gets in the way of the life of victory and success that you have for us. If anyone who is watching has a spirit of complaining in their lives that they would recognize that it is a problem, not just for them, but for those around them. And that if they surrender to you and apply these truths that we have all heard together, that they will not only overcome complaining, they will enjoy the life you've given them. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, thank you again for watching. What a joy, what a blessing it is to share God's word with you. I look forward to seeing you next time as we continue our series, How to Enjoy the Rest of Your Life.